Hi friends, good morning. Uh, thanks for joining us today for Knowing Your Home, Container Gardening. We're thrilled uh, to be joined by Paul at Lakewood Garden Center. We're gonna get started here in just a moment, uh, give folks a chance to join uh, in on the workshop. So we'll be back with you, just hang with us. Uh, we are standing at, uh, we were at five and jumped immediately to 24 participants, which is fantastic. So uh, hang on just a little bit longer. We'll be back with you momentarily. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the folks who just joined us. I'm Ian Andrews with Lakewood Alive. Uh, we're going to get started here in just a little bit. Uh, thanks for joining us for this Knowing Your Home workshop series on a, a brisk but hopeful Saturday morning uh, as we are uh, in the midst of spring. We're going in the right direction. So we'll be back with you in just a moment, okay? Good morning, everyone. We're holding steady, so I think we'll get started. Uh, my name is Ian Andrews. I'm the executive director at Lakewood Alive. Thrilled to have you joining us today for Knowing Your Home Container Gardening. Uh, this is the second of the Knowing Your Home workshop series. We kicked off earlier this week, had a really great discussion. Uh, and so we're excited to have Paul from Lakewood Garden Center, uh, one of our favorite small businesses and favorite business owners to work with. Allison's going to intro him in just a moment. Uh, but before we get started, Lakewood Alive is a nonprofit community development organization. Our mission is to foster and sustain vibrant neighborhoods. And we're grateful to the sponsors who help us not only put on this program, but support our efforts to ensure uh, that we're doing everything we can uh, to uh, have a, a vibrant and uh, wonderful community uh, that we all love to live, work, and play in. Our sponsors today are the City of Lakewood, uh, Cleveland Lumber, First Federal Lakewood, and Lakewood Public Library. We appreciate their support. So without further ado, I'd like to kick it over to Allison Urbanic. Allison is our Housing and Internal Operations Director. So Allison, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Ian. And thanks all of you for being with us today, and especially to Paul. Especially, I think you're starting to get real busy down there at the Garden Center. So thank you for spending your Saturday morning with us. This is probably prime time uh, at down there at the Garden Center. So we're excited to have you. And today, uh, our workshop is going to be focusing on container gardening. So I'm excited to learn more. So I know we did this last year and it's very exciting, but we're bringing it back. I think we're gonna learn from experience over the past year and maybe some new tips and tricks. So it should be a really exciting workshop. We are taking questions from you, the audience. If you see at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q and A uh, button. If you hit that, you'll be able to put your questions in there and Ian's going to uh, jump in uh, throughout the presentation with your questions to help us guide the conversation. We want to hear from you. We want to hear your experiences. Uh, we want to hear your questions. So please feel free to share them with us. And uh, I hope that we can make the most of this. We're very excited. Um, so Paul, we're going to turn it over to you. And if you want to do a brief introduction of who you are, and then we can jump right in. All right, sounds good. Um, well, my name's Paul, uh, the owner down at Lakewood Garden Center. Uh, yeah, work with uh, Allison and Ian for <laughs> probably a, a lot longer than I realize anymore. Um, and, you know, we've just been uh, in the, the industry for uh, over 20 years now. And, uh, you know, just here to share with you what we've learned over the years and just kind of see if we can help you have a better experience in the yard this year. Great, I'm excited and I am going to take advantage of the Hello. Hey Paul, we're here. Can you hear us? Okay, I, I can hear you guys. Okay, great. Lost Allison. Okay. We're going to wait for Allison's connection to come back and join us. Uh, but Paul, I know we've got uh, a great uh, PowerPoint presentation. So we're going to get Allison back here in just a moment. We'll get that fired up. Are we still good on our audio and video? I'm good on my end. Okay, sounds good. Hopefully Allison will come back. 
thanks for uh, bearing with us, folks. Uh, eventually, we'll get back into person uh, and maybe even be able to come down and take over the garden center uh, where we'll be able to have the workshop. Right, Paul? That'd be a fun, fun afternoon, fun evening. Hey, how's it going down there right now in terms of getting all the product in and getting everything ready for spring? We're doing pretty good. We, uh, we're, we're having some struggles. Uh, anything imported is a little bit difficult right now. Um, it seems like every industry is having their... Uh, you know, sorts of sorts of issues, um, you know, and, and we're no different. Uh, demand is very high again. Um, and, you know, with, with a couple of weeks of beautiful, um, you know, it, it's been a, a pretty, pretty uh, intense beginning to the season. Understood. And so are you seeing that, you know, while we've all uh, had some, some struggles here with COVID, both, you know, personally and even professionally and throughout businesses, has demand been pretty strong, you know, last year and where a lot of folks kind of in, investing time and money into their yards? Yeah, we definitely saw a big uptick in, in that, um, you know, last year was, was, was pretty stressful, but it was also pretty cool to see, you know, how many new people were, were jumping into the, the, the gardening and, you know, house plants and, you know, just trying to, to find something to keep themselves active and, and busy if they weren't going to be, uh, you know, traveling or, or you know, doing the, the restaurants or, you know, movies. And, you know, they, they, they turned to us and that was, you know, pretty cool. And, and um, yeah, it was it, it was a, it was a much different year last year. That's for sure. And, and when you had new folks coming in, did you see that there were a lot of amateurs? And I don't mean that in a disparaging way, but but it was an opportunity to start kind of coaching and educating folks on on getting um just starting to get their their feet wet in uh in gardening yeah there was there was plenty of that last year and and, and the trend seems to be continuing into this season and uh you know that's that's kind of what what we're there for and you know if if you're you know nervous or apprehensive and but you want to do it you know we'd like you to come down and see us and you know, we can, we can help you get started and, and point you in the right direction. So you have a, a pleasurable experience and you want to, you know, continue with it. I'll tell you, I think that's one of the best things about, uh, about coming down and talking to you and the team is it, you know, you all know what you're talking about. It's not just, you know, go over to this spot under some big box and hope you find it, or I'm really not too sure what this is. You're going to give some really good instruction and valuable information that's going to help them to be successful. So we certainly appreciate that. So thank you and the team for doing a great job. No problem. All right, we're going to kick over to Allison, whose power I think is back on. We had a momentary blip, but we're all good, right? Yeah, yeah, we had a little blip over here on Spring Garden, but we're back up, ready to go. So sorry about that, but thank you. This is why we have two people who uh, help moderate these workshops. Um, so, Paul, this is my favorite workshop. Don't tell the others. I really love this one because we get such great insight into what we need to do to have fantastic containers. And as we know, over the past year, and you can probably attest to this, gardening has been the outlet for folks. They use it to get outside of their house. They use it to feel good. It's probably what it's always been, but I think you've probably seen a lot of new people coming to the garden center over the past year. Yeah, we've definitely had a uh, an uptick in, in new gardeners. Um... I think uh, nationally, it was somewhere between 15 and 20 million people took up gardening um, last year. And it, it seems to be that that trend is going to continue into 21. And for people in Lakewood or, you know, the inner ring suburbs, you know, probably Cleveland Heights, wherever people are coming from, or folks who have big yards, container gardening is a nice, I'm not going to say it's easy. It's not easy, but probably a less uh, intensive way of gardening. W would you agree with that statement? Yeah, I, we love um, we love potting up containers, and you know, I certainly enjoy you know building a, a, a beautiful landscape around the yard and everything uh, along those lines. But when you pull out the pots and you get the you know the the bag of nice loose fluffy potting soil, and you know you you've picked all your um, you know plants out that you want to grow, and it's it's time to get in the dirt. I, I think the uh, you know, the experience is a lot um, less physically demanding and certainly, um, you know, something that anybody can uh, take part in. That's great. So I'm looking forward to this. I'm going to just preface this with I'm excited. I'm going to be investing in the 
uh, and I'm blanking on the name now, but the pots that don't, they aren't actual pots. They're the mesh netting pots, smart, smart pots. pots. Yes, uh, my tomatoes. I have, this is the year I'm gonna try them for my tomatoes. I've tried tomatoes in my garden. I've tried them in pots, smart pots are what I'm trying this year because they just get too big and I didn't plan accordingly with the size of my pot. So I'm usually kicking myself about July, beginning of August, uh, when they're telling, they're like cursing at me because I didn't put them in a big enough pot. Well, the smart pots will help you um, a lot and uh, we'll touch on that a little bit later. Great, great. Well, we're excited to have you again, so thank you. And I'm gonna just remind folks that we are taking questions. If you use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to put in your questions, uh, Ian will be uh, reading those throughout the presentation. So Ian, if we could start the presentation, please. Great. So Paul, your presentation, I would also say is probably one of the best that we get. Very colorful and beautiful. So we look forward to see what you have uh, for us today. All righty. Well, um, thank you for that. We uh, use a lot of what we did uh, last year. If, if it was good, then it's probably pretty good now. We, we've updated a little bit. So uh, you know, to include some stuff we've learned in our uh, continuing education classes and, you know, to show you some some stuff that, that we've done since we uh, last covered this topic. Um, just get started, you know, wanted to real quickly say thank you to, to Allison and Ian and, and Lakewood Alive, all the, the sponsors, um, you know, this event were, were businesses and uh, places we've, we've visited and supported over the past year too. So if you get an opportunity, um, check those place out, places out as well. Um, but we'll jump right in here. So, um, you know, container gardening is, is essentially just that, um, gardening in, in some sort of a container. And, uh, you know, the, the big thing there is, is, is choosing the right container, filling it the right way, and then you, you want to get it planted and, and, and maintaining it throughout its uh, growth cycle or, or season, depending on what you're uh, growing, are going to be um, some things we'll talk about. Uh, when you're selecting your containers, you, you, you want to have an idea of what you're doing um, before you go ahead and, and make that container choice, especially in a, an environment like, like Cleveland or Lakewood. Um, you know, where we have, you know, pretty severe winters or, or we have the ability to have them. Um, if you're looking for something that you want to keep outside year round, you want to understand the risks associated with using each kind of container. Um, you know, and if you want to have something that, that is a, a four season container, um, you know, generally we suggest that you choose something that's going to be concrete or wood and, or, or plastic. Um, and, and it'll respond a little bit better to the freeze and thaw cycles that we have. Um, filling your containers, you want to use, um, you know, good potting soil in, in, in all sorts of containers. You want to stay away from uh, topsoil in those containers. And, and you, you find out that if you build the foundation for your containers, you're going to have much, uh, much better uh, success throughout the season. Planting is, is pretty simple. It's the, the fun part, I think. You, you get the stuff out, you, you ruffle up the roots, you tear the bottom off, and, and you slap it in. Um, and then maintaining is probably the, the part that we all struggle with and, uh, you know, can be a little burdensome. Burden some, but if you uh, you know take the steps and, and you, you you choose the right containers, you fill them appropriately. Main, maintenance should be a lot easier. Uh, we'll, we'll bump ahead, Ian. And and you know just touching on what what is a container. If if you look at the little uh, uh, thumbnails of the the objects, they're they're all things we've planted throughout the years, and you know the the limits to what you can grow in is, is really going to be your imagination. Um, and you know, the, the, the big thing when you, you choose your container, you just want to consider if it, if it drains or, or if it, if it can drain and how you're going to, you know, accommodate the plant that you choose to put in it based off of, uh, you know, the, the limitations of the container you have, we can bump forward. 
that's that's my favorite um that's a uh an old dumpster we we salvaged from a uh industrial surplus store on the, the east side and we, we sanded that thing down and filled it with uh plants i, I think that year's still my favorite I, I hope to beat that but you know there's there's a lot of plants in there and and we set set them up right by choosing the appropriate size container you, you can see we've built a trellis around the sides and, and strung netting from it and you know we filled that with uh some really nice soil and we choose the plants and we take care of them um and and the results in that picture are uh they're always fun to look at uh, I, I think it's been two or three years since we did that container and and, and boy that thing still uh stands up pretty well we can uh bump through that. so See, before we go through to the next slide sorry could you tell us what's in that beautiful pot all right so um we'll start from the uh bottom there's a, a chartreuse leaf uh, about the size of a penny that's creeping jenny um we affectionately refer to it around the store as creepy jenny um because she's always showing up um if, if that plant makes it into your your beds um it'll it'll come back year after year but it's a it's a great plant for containers because you can see how it, it kind of thrives in the the under uh the underside of the the petunias and there's a dusty miller in there and uh looks like there's a, a swedish ivy um tucked in the back behind the red petunias the the sides are, is a really cool plant that um i i think a lot of people should should consider growing at least once to determine if you like it it's called malabar spinach and it's a a warm weather spinach that really thrives in the heat of the summer when a, a lot of our uh coal crops are, are slowing down or, or shutting down for the season that baby just goes strong and, and it's uh, a pretty uh vigorous grower so if you have a trellis for it, you can you can pick the leaves off of that and eat it all year. Uh, there's some maroon coleus in the back. Uh, looks like three three sets of it. Um, sometimes when we're trying to create that effect, uh, we'll jam maybe three pots in there. It looks like that's what we did that year. You can kind of see that there might be three in maybe even more individual plants in each little cluster there, and then. Uh, we topped it off with with mandavia. It's a, a tropical vine um, that that really thrives in the heat of the summer, and uh, we we supported it with the trellis netting, and and that 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 container really filled out well for us uh, throughout the course of that year. Oh, it's beautiful, and thank you for going through. So the Malabar spinach is that the it vines up the side of the dumpster container. That's Correct. the spinach. Correct. Yeah. yeah, that uh, that plant's a it, it's peculiar be, because it sits there and it sits there and it sits there, um, and then once it starts going, it, it takes off and goes gangbusters. Um, beautiful little flowers throughout it, and and a nice little seed um, pot even after that. Uh, kind of a, a a white little cluster flower with with some black seed pods throughout the season. A, a very cool plant. Great. Well, thank you so much. Looks like uh, there's a couple questions. If uh, if you guys want to give me those, if, you know, yeah. we could answer those real quick. Or if if we should wait, I'm fine with that. No, all good. Let's do it. Uh, we do have a few. Uh, one question on smart smart pots. So let's hold on that. But one, the first question we got was, and I'm sure this uh, is bothersome for lots of folks. Uh, how do you handle squirrels, not just in gardens, but specifically with container gardening? Whew. Um that that's a it, it is a, a pretty um tough tough problem and it's one we deal with consistently um with with varying levels of success it, it seems to be that everybody's squirrels kind of have their own uh individual characteristics and uh tolerance for repellents the uh the, the way we seem to have the most success um, around here is uh, a combination of dog enclosure and um, uh, a combination of bone and blood meal uh, in, in addition to, um, you know, some, some plantings that uh, 
you know, keep them at bay, things that, that they're not especially fond of. We'll, um, we'll mix in marigolds and, and onions and garlic through, throughout the perimeter of the garden. Some of the more fragrant um, herbs at the edge of a pot certainly help from time to time. And then, uh, you know, there's those squirrels that regardless of what you do, they don't care. Um, there are um, countless videos on YouTube to, to how adaptable and, and intelligent that the squirrels actually are if they decide that, you know, what, what they want is, is that peanut, um, you know, out of your pot or, or whatever, you know, plant that may be. They may just be mad at you. Um, in some instances, it, it seems that you know they they really just dislike your presence there, and that's you know what you're fighting for for no good reason. But uh, you know the other thing we think that's pretty simple to uh, help keep the squirrels at bay is um, uh, completely floating out of my brain at this point. Um, don't feed them, uh, you know, don't, don't welcome them into your yard and then try to do it on your terms. It's, it's difficult to, uh, you know, do that with success when they're coming to you for their food. Um, you know, and if you could discourage your, your neighbors from feeding them, um, you know, that, that should lessen the, uh, the, the number of visits you have in your yard by the squirrels. Yeah, I think whoever finds a way to keep squirrels out of the yard will become a billionaire, yeah, uh, probably. Sure. <laughs> uh, so another question we have um, is, does Malabar spinach come in seeds or seedlings? Uh, we, we should have both this year. Sometimes the seedlings are harder to find. Um, I, I, I believe the year they were in the container, I had a, a buddy of mine bring them to me from another garden center. Um, and you know, if you need the plant, you need the plant. I, I'm, I can be shameless in that way. Um, this year, I know we have the seeds on the shelf uh, and, and I'm expecting to carry the plants as well. Great, great. Um, and then we have another question here uh, that um, we have about directional growing. So this person has a deck trellis that faces to the east and they are looking for a creeping plant that will do the best in that type of sunlight. Any suggestions? All right. Well, I'm going to po uh, assume that um, in, in east face is going to be a morning sun. Um, and, and if you're looking for a, a, a vine, was there, was there a clarification um, in the question as to whether or not we're looking for food or just flowering? Um, no, there wasn't Sarah, if you want to add on to your question, um, but if we could potentially talk about both, um, we have lost our presentation temporarily because Ian uh, has lost his router connection because this is what happens with Lakewood Alive presentation. <laughs> so let's really lean into these questions uh, for the time being. Hey, we can, we can do this uh, for two hours if we need to. Um, you know, right now, I think if I was going to want to plant something on a vine, the, the first thing I would look at would be peas. Um, you know, while it's a little bit cooler, I, I try to stay away from some of the uh, uh, more tropical um, plants and, and try to stick with stuff that is, is going to do okay with the, the uh, highs and lows of Cleveland weather. Um, you know, I, I don't think there'd be any reason you couldn't grow a, a clematis in such a setting. Um, I, I, if we're doing it a container, a little tricky through the winter, but we, we over most of the ones we kept above ground this this past winter made it through. Um, I think, you know, probably around 10 percent we lost, which which isn't too bad. Um, you know, there are. Uh, a whole myriad of plants as the season progresses that we'll get into climbing uh, black eyed Susan vine, uh, climbing hydrangeas. Oh, those are, those are a few of them. Uh, the Mandevilla is certainly another one we'll have. And, and I'm, I'm sure I'm, you know, struggling to find a few more, but uh, there, they'll be around. Great. Great. Uh, so we have another question about pesky things. Uh, any insight into deer, keeping deer away? I feel like these people would be billionaires too if they found a way to keep deer away. But any insight into that? Um, you know, I think uh, the, the best uh, 
if the squeaker toy is too loud just let me know i'll get rid of it um <laughs> if you can hear it i don't know um but the uh um the the best thing for deer i i think is is an enclosure um you know good fences good neighbors type of approach and uh you know that's that's really um you know we live at the edge of the reservation and uh you know we haven't seen um you know deer even tempting uh you know the backyard and 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 they seem to do okay um you know just moseying through the front yard and, and choosing plants that they're not going to be interested in goes goes a long way uh as well there's there's numerous repellent products keeping the environment um fresh for deer i think is is another good deterrent they really don't like um uh you know changes in the environment they they thrive on consistency and knowing the environment that they're, they're in and becoming comfortable in that um you know but that being said in last spring about this time uh at the the church next door um that there was a mother who had two fawns and really the only saving grace we had was the fence she spent you know the better part of two months um around and you know we, there was a, a morning we we had to kind of chase her away from entering our fence but um you know that fence did did seem to be the uh the best the best thing going um and you know that's it, sometimes it, it's tough for people to do that but you know you, if you swallow that pill you know and you fight that fight from the beginning your, your success is going to be a lot easier and you know you don't have to put the time and, and effort into the repellents and the successes and failures with dealing with those and uh you know the, the time I, i'd assume that after uh you know, a year of fighting the deer pretty good. You could have just probably built a little fence of some sort. So uh, the Urbanic family secret, and I don't know if it works, and I'm sorry if you can hear my dogs. It's now just that time of day, I guess. They're playing. Uh, the Urbanic family secret, and you can tell me if you've heard this, was my grandma would hang bars of Irish spring soap on her fence surrounding her garden, and she claimed, swore up and down, that the Irish spring soap would keep the deer away. Yeah, that's, um, we work with an orchard guy who uh, sells kind of an Irish Springs uh, on steroids. It's It's got the uh, um, the hole drilled through it and it's got a twist tie ready to go. Um, you know, so, you know, if it, it's been successful for, for our customers, it's been successful for growers that we deal with and, and you know, it was successful for grandma. And, you know, I think that's, you know, the cool thing, but then there's going to be people that it's not successful for. And, you know, I, I don't know how to answer that other than kind of trial and error and, and finding out what the, the particular deer, um, you know, in your neighborhood don't like. Great. So, uh, Ian, I think we're ready to get back to the presentation. Great. I just, if you uh, became the host, uh, can you share? Oh, uh, sure. Yes. Right. Sorry, team. Uh, Boy, I, the, the troubles of the internet at home and the router, uh, I have a lot of redundancies. If you can see my setup here, it's pretty insane and they didn't really matter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see here. Sorry. I'm, uh, there we oh, go. Good. Thanks for bearing yes. with us, everybody. My, my apologies. Okay. We are back in business. I, well, I lost a couple of the questions. I think it sounded like Allison asked most of them. So we've got a few, we'll get back to a little bit later and let's uh, let's continue sharing screen. Are we good, Allison? You're good to go. Okay, here we go, great, thanks. All right, so um, you see some of the questions, uh, you know, some of them we've touched on already, and um, it's really about choosing a, a container. Um, you know, sometimes I have a spot that we're, we're looking to, to choose a container for. Other times I, I see the container and I'm kind of compelled by that, and we're going to grow something in that regardless, and, you know, then we're going to find the spot for it. Um, and then other times it's like, you know, you, you look at a plant and you're like, I, I need to have this plant. Um, you know, I, I don't know where I'm going to grow it. I don't have a spot in the yard for it. So, um, you know, you, you choose the container based upon, 
you know, what, what you fell in love with. I know uh, this week we're out at a, a, a nursery looking at, at plants and, you know, just kind of discovering some new stuff or some forgotten things. And, uh, you know, I, I found plants that if I can figure out where they're going to go, I'm going to have those plants and then I'll need to find pots for them, um, which is, you know, fun. I, I think that's, uh, you know, those kind of trips and, and, and finding the new plant and, and getting to choose the new pot is, is a lot of the, the cool thing about, um, you know, having a, a garden or, or, you know, being involved in gardening. And, uh, you know, we, we do it every winter. We, we get to open up uh, pallets and pallets of pots and see what we ordered the, the previous summer. And, you know, it's, it's just a really cool time. Um, this year we've we've tried to to represent ourselves pretty well with with a lot of different types of containers um day in and day out the glazed ceramic which is what is uh pictured here is the, the most popular amongst our customers um we've tried plastic pots with little to no success um we'd like to think that that we were a little bit early on the the smart pots and and we've you know really started to build um you know that that uh that side of our business and and it's really um become a, a better known gardening technique and, and the successes there are something we'll talk about um a little bit later on uh not as much concrete as i might like to have but it's a pandemic um wood prices if you're you're looking at any of that stuff are, are through the roof um you know i i thought last last year we were going to start uh with a guy who was going to make some custom wooden planters for us and the, the pandemic kind of shut that down but if if you've got the wood you can build them um you know i'm, I'm not sure if i'd go out and, and purchase wood to build a container or a window box this year it'll be a uh, an expensive endeavor but if you got the time and maybe a, a little bit of extra money from a stimulus check or three um you know that might be something you entertain and then the last thing we think you ought to, you know, really consider as, as you go um, through your container selection is, is what are you doing with that uh, container in the winter? Um, you know, all of them, I think, have their, their pluses and minuses, but one of the big downsides of the, the ceramic um, is, is what do you do with it in the winter? Uh, you know, time and time again, our answers are, are you know, upside down and, and empty is the best way for for the container to go through the winter um you know but you can pull them into your garage and and, and try to keep them you know if, if they go in dry you can you can keep them full and um you know bring that soil out and able to reuse it for the next year um but you know if you want something that's that's year round you may want to look at a, a wooden a plastic or a concrete container um i think we can bump forward so before we do that oh go ahead Allison. Sorry, uh, you might be asking this, Ian, but is there an actual difference between the style of pot other than like for growing things like ceramic versus plastic versus wood? Are there any upsides or downsides on the types of pots? Yeah, I mean, there, there's definitely um, some variations between each. Um, I think one of the, the, the prime examples of that, it would be like a terracotta or a clay pot. Um, we generally suggest that if you're going to use a terracotta or a clay, you, you soak that in, in water since it is a porous material. If, if the, con, if the container is not holding the moisture, when you go to add the soil, um, you'll, you'll take all that water from the soil and transfer it to the pot. If you've, if you've watered a, a, a newly planted terracotta pot, you've come back a half hour later and you're like, where'd the water go? I, I swear I watered this. Well, it simply was was absorbed into the clay, um, and and you're right, you watered it, but you're going to need to do it again. Um, you know, the, the smart pots have have a lot of benefits to them um, in terms of heating up quicker, with with not having as much of a wall to heat. Um, you know, the downside of that is is you cool off quicker too, and and sometimes that can be a positive as we get into the heat of the summer. Um, you know, the the glazed pots are. are there, there's, there's quality there. Um, you know, I think you see a little bit less evaporation through the actual container as you would on a, uh, um, you know, a wooden or a terracotta 
you're just going to lose uh, far less water, if any, through that uh, glaze on the outside. Oh, I think, does that, does that help? Very much so. I never knew. And that makes a lot of sense because I get frustrated uh, with my terracotta pots. Uh, and now I know I should soak them. So that was very helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, thanks, Paul. That helps me out too. I definitely learned something brand new right there. Uh, same. I did. It, want it makes to... sense. You know, I had to learn that too, probably well, well after I, I should have known that. But, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those, duh. Well, hey, that's why you're the expert. Hey, I did. I was uh, taking notes, and I just did. Just want to ask, where did you uh, address the question around the Malabar spinach? Because I know that was uh, brought up when Allison asked you to kind of describe what was in that uh, in that container. Had, had you guys gotten to the Malabar part? Yeah, I believe we answered that. Okay, perfect. And we've got a few more, but you know what? I think you're probably going to get to them, so I'm going to hold. We'll continue. Go to the next slide. Okay. Sounds good. So, um, you know, un understanding where you're going to place that container um, is, is helpful in choosing it. And it's also helpful um, in, in choosing uh, what's going to go inside of it. Uh, you know, a, a container, we, we, we prefer that pots have drainage, but, you know, a lot of people are looking to, to bring stuff inside and, and, and they're starting to be a, a more of a call for, for containers that don't have drainage. We, we prefer to see you do a saucer, um, you know, but would understand why you wanted to stay away from that as well. Can I um, ask a question about that? Mm -hmm. The indoor, so I um, learned the hard way and perhaps again, this is science and terracotta uh, that I did use the saucers, but then if I have it on a wood surface, uh, the terracotta, uh, saucer leaves a mark on my wooden surfaces. So I have, I've reclaimed Hello Kitty plastic plates. I've reclaimed whatever I can find. Uh, my grandmother's like pewter plates, which you could never eat off of because you'll probably die. Um, so, uh, you know, what do you, what do you, Paul, at your house put under your terracotta saucers? <laughs> Nothing. Um, we, uh, we don't do much indoors. Uh, I want to be very transparent in that. Uh, it, I think, uh, we've been married 13 years. We're working on our, uh, longest living house plant, which is currently in aloe at just over a year now. Um, <laughs> that's you know, surprising to me. It's, uh, it's just, it's not something, you know, most of our, our, our interest is, is out outdoors and we've tried to bring plants in the house and, you know, it's just not our thing, um, is, as much as we wanted it to be, um, you know, we'll, we'll go water the pots outside every day, but for some reason, the inside stuff we forget about, and then eventually it's dead. Um, but I think what, you know, you found out with, with your wooden surfaces and the terracotta saucers is, is probably, um, you know, more towards staying away from a, uh, a terracotta saucer and, and uh, using a plastic or a dish. Um, you know, the, uh, we've got some, some newer, um, saucers in it's, it's, it's a plastic saucer. There's nothing terribly new about it, but, um, you know, some that, that don't, uh, have the same footprint on the wood. So you'd get some air circulation underneath the saucer as well. Um, you know, and, and that's, uh, it's also something that, that we uh, think that, you know, thrift stores are really cool for because you can go find a, a plate or a dish or, or God knows what that, you know, would be the perfect saucer for, for the containers that you're using. And, you know, if you can pick it up for a buck, that's also pretty cool too. Great. Thank you. So, um, you know, and then just understanding where, where you're putting that, that, um, plant be it sun or shade uh, the the seasons change so frequently um you know most of lakewood seems to be you know on a, a north south east west grid um you know which makes things pretty simple but is that the the sun and the the earth you know rotate throughout the the course of the the growing season those angles change and and, and what may be, you know, full sun right now when you go out and look is, is going to be something completely different in, in six weeks when all the trees are leafed out and the, the sun's now, you know, here till 10 o'clock at night and, and 
you know, just being aware of those things can, can go a long way uh, towards your, your success um, with your containers. And then, you know, the, the other, um, you know, site, site specific conditions, I think is, is pretty important. Just, you know, like one site specific condition, I think that we're all dealing with is Lakewood. Like the wind never stops here. It doesn't, um, you know, that there's, there's different days in, in terms of humidity and, and what your location is. And, and, and do you have your, your containers super exposed? Um, are they in a corner where they don't get any wind? That can be a detriment too sometimes. Um, you know, and, and, you know, the, the, we, we touched on them a, a minute ago was that the deer and the squirrels and the rabbits, we put in a, a, a pretty, a pretty cool little garden we'll, we'll share as we get in, but, um, you know, over the course of the winter, the chipmunks have taken residence in there. So now, you know, I go out there and water everything and then I try to fill their, you know, them with water to, to hope that, you know, go back to living just on the other side of my garden. I'll, I'll leave you there, you know, but not in my garden. So, you know, those are things to consider as well. Hey, Paul, if I can, um, <clears throat> we do have a question. Uh, how do you keep your containers looking fresh all season? Uh, and how often should you fertilize and cut back? Um, we'll get to that. It may even be like the next slide. Um, but, uh, you know, starting with good soil and feeding um, are, are very important things. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more on that um, in, in just a, a few seconds here. Um, you know, oh, identifying... Sure what what you're looking to grow is is going to be part of uh you know the 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 solution to, to keeping them looking happy uh you know we'll, we'll use a, a a few different products and, and fertilizers throughout the course of the growing season to keep everything looking fresh and happy um you know but if you can identify what you're trying to grow first and uh you know, if, if you can identify that, we can we can help you keep everything a little bit fresher, a little bit easier. Um, and there's no reason you can't grow anything on this chart in a container. Um, you know, you, you just got to stick with the right the right containers and, and set yourself up for success. So we'll bump through that. Sounds good. Next slide, please. You got it. We touched on the glazed ceramic. We can we can bump through that. Smart pots. Um, here we go, Allison. Uh, really, kind of um, the the newer side of things in in gardening, and uh, it's it's a, a semi permeable fabric. Um, give me one second here. It, it allows for for aeration of the soil and and drainage of water, and and probably the coolest thing it does is it. Uh, prunes the roots with with air um, and that's really where I think that the major um, advance in, in allowing the plants to be happiest are uh, is, is we bump um, further and further in into society oh I'm sorry I didn't want to um, thank you uh, you know it, it's really no surprise right now that uh, you know marijuana or cannabis are, are pretty pretty much on the forefront of of, of the nation in terms of uh, gardening right now. And, and in a lot of places, um, I think almost all states now have some sort of uh, allowance for, for marijuana and it be it med medical um, marijuana or, or even recreational. But the, the, the cool stuff that's coming out of that and, and the things that we benefit with the most is, is these guys are trying to grow five, five to $10,000 plants in, in one pot and, and what they found is is these smart pots uh, a, a lot of times are really the way to to have the best success growing. Um, and and what happens with an air pruned um, root compared to a, uh, a a root that grows in a ceramic or a plastic uh, pot is is that root gets to the edge of the the pot and it feels the air and it it kind of simulates growing off the side of a cliff. So what you end up with is signals going back to the plant that that you know we might want to um, develop a, a little bit different 
root system and and this would be the best place for me to stop growing so what happens is is all the the little fibers and and roots that shoot off of that main root really get a lot more of the energy that 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 initial root was going to take and and when you pull um you know the plants out of that soil you see a, a much different root structure than you would in a, a normal plant i think as as time progresses uh if if the innovations continue you'll see a lot of nurseries starting to go to these types of containers um, because it does get you a bigger, healthier plant a little bit faster. Um, impossible to really truly overwater. The, the, the soil reaches a saturation point and, and the container does as well. And, and once it, it, it's saturated, it, it cannot physically hold any more water. So excess is, is quickly discarded. Um, some people grow on saucers with those. Um, we, we simply just grow them right on the uh, the ground, be it uh, wood chips, concrete, um, or uh, pavement. <clears throat> and we've had pretty good success with all of them. Uh, you know, so, but the, the downside of, of that is um, you, you do need to feed uh, uh, pretty regularly. Um, we, we alternate on a, a, a six and a, uh, three week feed schedule with those, uh, generally using an organi organic granular fertilizer. Uh, it's a happy frog or a plant tone. And then we generally uh, supplement with uh, bone meal and, and we do scatter a little blood meal as a uh, more of a deterrent than anything uh, across the uh, top of the soil as well. So that's a smart pot. I'm sure there'll be um, some questions there if uh if anybody has any we'll, we'll take those right there now. are uh we do have uh at least two one was from earlier on uh dave asked about uh growing tomatoes in smart pots and he was trying to know what's the best way to keep those uh, allison mentioned he wants to grow tomatoes this year what's the best method of keeping them upright uh, in the smart pot so uh last year we grew tomatoes in the the smart pot uh beds um and and we had we had a little bit of difficulty. Um, most of them were were operator error or grower error on my behalf. Um, a lot of that stuff was was really starting to grow quickly uh, when we were still in the the crush of the season. So I hadn't uh, supported them as as I should have. Um, but you know the support there is is generally the the big thing. Um, if you can find a, a sheltered sunny wall to grow up against. I know that's what we've done uh, a numerous years at the garden center, a uh, west facing brick wall. And we've had great success with that. I've, I've strung some uh, trellises off the wall and, and we've done them in the beds and the pots. And, and the nice thing about the west facing wall is that the winds generally push in that direction. So, you know, it's, it's a little bit harder for it to blow over. Um, you know, we, we, we support and, and tie them to the trellis. And then the other, um, you know, some other things you could do to, to help your tomatoes from blowing over is, you know, choosing the right size pot. I, I think minimum a, a seven gallon container, but, you know, better better yet, maybe a, um, a 10 or a 15 gallon would give you a little bit more weight at the base. And you're gonna end up filling out that soil at the course of the end of the season anyhow. Um, you know, it'll it'll limit the the stresses on the plant throughout the season. You'll you'll have better um, ability to retain moisture, and and it'll kind of uh, help to to kind of keep the the ebbs and flows of the high water and the low water periods in the middle, and and consistency for the plants is is a lot better than uh, you know uh, super wet, super dry, super wet, super dry. You you want to um, you know have have a nice consistent amount of moisture for the plants and, and you want to have it consistently and, and, you know, take the stresses off of them as much as possible. Sounds good. Thank you, Paul. We also have a question if you could, and I realize there's varying sizes, but what are, uh, how much does smart pot, smart pots cost? Um, any estimates? Um, that my, my answer to those questions is usually, I'm not sure that's why we write them down. Um, I, I want to say, yeah, maybe at the low end, right about the Liquid 10. Garden Center. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, 
um you know we, we priced that stuff probably six weeks ago um and, and we've done so much so many things since then but i would think somewhere between me 10 12 dollars in and, and i think if you want to get into the bigger beds you can get up you know 80 90 um i, I think the majority of them would be under 20 dollars. okay very good and uh that's great thank you appreciate that we've got a few more but you know what right now i think uh the, the majority oh, wait we do have one uh can you put a smart pot inside a plastic or ceramic pot you can um you're going to lose lose some of the benefits of uh you know the the pot it's not going to be as exposed um to the to the air you'd really want to if you did that, make sure that you kept it completely off of the walls, um, you know, so you can have the, the benefits of the drainage and, uh, um, you know, the air pruning of the roots, but it's gardening. There's no reason, I, I, you know, if you wanted to do that, I'd try it for sure. Very good. We've got a couple others, but I think we're gonna get to them. So I'm gonna take a pause here and go back to your Allison or Paul. Okay, I ha do have a question about the smart pots, Paul. How do you store them in the winter? That's that's the beauty of the smart pot is, uh, you know, if if you're using the the smaller size at, at the end of the season, you're going to pull your plant out of there, and almost all the soil is going to come with it. Um, you know, at that point, you you fold up the container and and you uh, put it away in the garage after it's. We will usually lay them out or or, or hang them to dry. Um, you know, just so you're not putting wet stuff away. I know we have customers that run them through the washing machine um but yeah you can really just roll those up and that's a, a really nice thing is they they tuck almost anywhere into the uh um the the garage you, you know you should get you know probably five to six maybe even seven eight years out of out of each pot and you know rolling them up especially with our uh small yards our small garages and our small lots uh is a huge benefit awesome thank you So just a little bit about the, the benefits of, of wooden planters. Um, you know, they, they don't heat up quite as, as much as ceramic. They're durable and renewable. Um, you know, when uh, when I made this, this slide originally, wood wasn't, you know, like $10 for a two by four. So, um, you know, it was a, traditionally a little bit more affordable, but, you know, this might be a good time to see what you know, would you may have laying in a garage and in time to, you know, upcycle, recycle things, uh, you know, and, um, you know, you can, you can do something where, you know, you build it up a little bit higher, you know, such as the, the, the planter pictured there and, and, you know, it ends up being a little bit easier sometimes for, uh, you know, those, those that don't get around as well to, to garden, there's no, no bending over really involved in that. Um, we did that exact planter uh, last last year, and we had a lot of fun. We grew cucumbers, and uh, in the fall, we rotated out to, to uh, peas and, and carrots and lettuce, and, and the carrots are, are growing pretty strong still. And, uh, you know, I pulled a few of them out. They, they added a little bit over the winter, and, you know, probably by the 4th of July, we'll be eating those. We can go ahead and forward one. um you know drainage with uh with the containers is is big um you know where where does the water go sitting standing water for a for a plant is is almost always um a, a death sentence in terms of plants that we're going to sell at the garden center there's there's certainly pond plants and bog plants you know and some plants that'll tolerate water a lot better than others but um you know, when, when you can get the water off of the plants, that's, that's a pretty big uh, part of the, the life cycle of the plant. We'll talk a little bit more about that as, as we go, but, um, you know, we're carrying more and more pot feet and, and what that is, is simply just a, uh, a way to get the containers off the ground and, and allow air to flow underneath them. So you do fight, um, you know, root rot and, uh, um, you know, sometimes you're, you you can actually combat staining as well um, by just getting that airflow, uh, you know, under the pot and, and allowing things to dry off rather than to continually 
um, be wet and allowing mold and algae to grow. We can forward through there. Um, in, inside the pots is, is super important. Um, and it's probably at the forefront of, of our biggest struggle right now is, is keeping soil stocked in the store. Uh, the, the demand uh, for potting soil and, and the materials that go into it are in an all time high right now and, and getting soil in is uh, an adventure that, that we spend most of Monday and Friday mornings just trying to understand where we stand with um, right now. But using good um, soil, we, we think is is really important. Um, you know, there's there's a, a really big brand that we try to stay away from uh, at, at all costs. Um, it, it's just not really where you want to be in terms of um, you know good good ingredients and and focusing on on getting good plants. We we are really big fans of. Uh, Fox Farm and the, the soils that they promote and grow with, um, they they really are, uh, you know, on on the front front edge of of gardening and container gardening right now, and, and a lot of that um, their successes have uh, come uh, off of the uh, the marijuana um, industry in, in California and. Uh, it's it's really pretty impressive to see what happens when you start with with good soil. Um, the, the two that we really like are the happy frog. Currently, we're having a, a nightmare of a time trying to get that. Um, but they also have a, a strawberry fields line that, that we are able to get in stock uh, when we were doing our last order. And that soil is what um, we'll grow in this year at my house. And, and it's really been um, a, a fabulous product. And then the other um, one, which on the right is the uh, pine bark mini nuggets or, or pine bark nuggets. Uh, we're having the, the, the damnedest time getting those in stock and I haven't actually been able to, to get a bag this year. Um, you know, trucks out of the South aren't what they used to be. And, uh, you know, hopefully in the next couple of weeks we'll be able to get that product into stock, but it's just a nice way, a, a little bit easier way to help um, help your budget, help your uh, containers grow. It allows for drainage. And, you know, as you start filling the bigger um, ceramic pots, you could, you could end up putting three or four big bags of soil in it at, um, you know, roughly 20 bucks a bag that gets expensive pretty quick. So if you could uh, add a $6 bag of mulch in there and, and have um, success with that as well, we'd like to see you do that. So Paul, if I could ask a question then, I love Happy Frog. I did get the Strawberry Fields last year and I was disappointed I didn't get Happy Frog, but Strawberry Fields was great uh, and it worked out really well. So if if we're out shopping and you know, you're know you out of uh, those types, what are we looking for in a potting soil, if anything, that you could just highlight? Because you mentioned there was a big name out there that you're really not a big fan of. Yeah. What should we be looking for? So, you know, most of these bags have ingredient lists on them. Um, we generally want you to stay um, away from soils with a wetting agent. Um, it, we'd like to see you stay away from soils that have like a synthetic fertilizer in there, uh, be it time release or, um, you know, just a, um, a quick shot of, of fertilizer. The uh, um, the, the ingredients of the soil can be fertilizer uh, uh, onto themselves. Uh, you know, the happy frog will, will tell you right on the bag, it's, it's pH balanced, so it's got some lime added to it. And, you know, you're just really looking for a, a bag that, you know, if it, if it looks right, and, and, you know, one thing we always like is, is the smell test um, with, with soils and mulches. If it looks or it smells like garbage, chances are it is. Um, you know, and, and the wetting agents, I know we haven't had a, uh, a super wet season, but those years, you know, and, and, and this year could still certainly turn into that where, where you end up with, you know, a, a five, six week stretch of, of really um, wet weather that, that can be every bit as detrimental to the plant as it is um, beneficial. We've, we've used even, you know, the good soils with the natural wetting agents in them in wet years. And, 
and it's it's been difficult um you know to keep those plants alive because the, the water's on them and you know right now when the temperatures are cool the the cool wet's a, a recipe for disaster so we try to stay away from that uh, as much as possible great and then if we uh, are trying to find our pine bark nuggets really we want to just make sure that it's all natural and not dyed bark or anything like that it should just be a natural regular yep it- you got it um yeah the uh uh, just a, a, a straight bark, you know, nugget should be sufficient. Um, and and you, you don't want the dyes. Uh, it's been a long time since we messed with anything that, that was dyed, but I'd imagine if you were, uh, you know, dropping that in uh, as the water leaks through the mulch, you'd see some staining coming through as the, uh, the dye came off with the water. So yeah, just stick with natural stuff in the bottom of your containers for sure. Great, thank you. Ian, do you have any questions? I do. Hey, Paul, we've got a question from Kelly. Uh, she noted uh, that a lot of us have small yards in Lakewood, and while she doesn't compost, she does have a service to take and compost the kitchen waste. She wanted to know, what can we do with old soil that we take out of the pots and large raised planters? And also, how often do we need to change the soil? All right, so, um, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, y- using the soil, uh, you know, we always kind of find ways to lose it. it. It's something we've got pretty creative with over the years. I, I know last year, um, you know, for instance, the bed in front of the store, we had amended and added soil to, you know, pretty consistently for years. And and we just had more soil in that bed than we needed. Um, it had been a combination of potting soil and compost over the years. We, we simply put it in bags and, and threw it on Instagram and that soil disappeared within you know, a couple hours. Um, and, and I think, you know, that, that gardeners, if you know other gardeners, you know, talk to, talk to people. Um, you know, a lot of times we'll just dump those, those pots right into the bed, uh, next to it and just kind of smooth them out and, you know, work them in, but you know, the, the composting service is great. And, uh, you know, for those of us that live in Lakewood, that, that facility on Berea road is, is really a phenomenal resource that I think a lot of people don't, uh, fully utilize, but, you know, they, they have the, the yard waste truck that is going to be, you know, taken to a compost facility and, and you know, that, that product will be composted if you can't do it yourself or, you know, you don't, uh, if, you're, if you're not able or you haven't used Rust Belt Riders yet. Sounds good. Thanks, Paul. We do have one more question. Uh, Matt asks, do you recommend using filler such as packing peanuts um, in the bottom of a large container to displace the soil so you don't have to use quite so much? I mean, you can, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's all sorts of stuff you can use to do that. Um, you know, I, I prefer the bark. It's generally what we have. Um, I, I try not to have, especially in my life, packing materials laying around too long. They, they, they tend to mount up and, uh, you know, but if you had them and you needed a way to get rid of them, um, I could see you do that. And, uh, you know, maybe just kind of uh, put them in a plastic bag so you can keep them controlled and just remember they're in there when you go digging. Sounds good. We've got some other questions coming up about some uh, annuals and veggies. So I think we're going to hold for now. Uh, we'll continue on. All right, we can, yeah, there we go. Um, you know, just a uh, little, little picture of, of what we do um, down at city center and, and generally uh, over the years, the, the main, um, uh, you know, the main design theory around these plants is, is thrill, fill and spill. So, you know, the, the concept is you, you pick a plant that's, you know, gorgeous and, and is, is thrilling to the eye. And, and then you, you run some plants that, that fill out the container and then ultimately you, you, you have some that spill over to sides. Um, so, <laughs> excuse me. Um, but the, uh, you know, the container there is you, you see that, you know, we've got some, some coleus in there, the, the green and white leaf, the green and maroon leaf uh, towards the left side of the picture. Uh, looks like more of a maroon and chartreuse uh creeping jenny's hanging out there again um we've got the uh oh for the love of god the spikes at the top um you know so i i try to 
I try to make the whole thing be a thrill. Um, I don't like, I'm not a huge fan of wasting uh, space with, with boring stuff just to kind of fill the space. I, I, I like, I like stuff that, you know, you want to look at throughout, um, you know, at, at the same time, you know, you're going to need to look at um, stuff that does, you know, eat some space though. And, and, you know, if you look at the container that, um, you know, the coleus and the petunias and the creeping Jenny are, are probably out of, of bigger pots, but the ageratum, the, the blue and, and the salvia, um, the spikier blue in the, the mid-level, those plants probably came out of flats. It's a, it's a easier, uh, way to, to get volume. And, you know, sometimes the smaller plugs associated with those plants are easier to tuck into to small spaces. And, you know, you could, you could get 36 plants in a, a tray, you know, for, you know, I think 18 bucks is, is where we're going to be at this year. So, you know, you're looking at roughly 50 cents a, a, a plant versus a, uh, you know, a, a coleus, which, you know, some of those can be, you know, 13, 14, 99. So, you know, mix and match and, you know, try to figure out how to, uh, um, you know, stretch your dollar and, and your pop. Um, you know, the creeping Jenny looking at that one, I'm, I'm curious that we've got a perennial grower that grows those in, in gallon containers and it's really the same plant as the one you would buy in the four inch. But when you buy it, you start with it at, you know, twice, you know, maybe three times the size as you would coming out of a four inch container. And that's something else you can do to, um, you know, fill, fill bigger gaps or bigger pots. These, these containers are in front of marks and they're huge, but they're so fun to plant, but they take a lot of plants. So, you know, sometimes, uh, um, Sean, uh, Sean McGowan and I worked together on that project that, you know, we, we find different stuff for some bigger plants to really eat space in those those containers. So, you know, don't be afraid to look outside the box. We can we can bump through unless uh, you got anything. OK, um, Ian, is it possible that we're running the wrong version of this? I've got the most uh, recent uh, dated yesterday, uh, but if we're missing something. Uh... Wonder if I gave you the wrong one. Um, you just bump through a real, a few of them. You got it. No problem. One more. Yep. Um, want to stay here? You want to go back? Uh, trying to think here. Are, are you able to perhaps switch to the PDF that I emailed or did I send this one again? Uh, this is the one that's on the flash drive. So if you want to hold on, how about how about we do this? Uh, it, I'm sure it may came up, come up, but if you want to take a few questions, I'm going to give them to you, and then we'll see if we can retrieve the PDF. Does that sound Ian, all right? Ian, if it's easier, I can read the questions. Yeah, perfect. That'd be great, Allison. Thank you. Okay, so... All right, guys, this is what happens when you blend agriculture with a computer. Um, you know, you're doing great. Don't worry at all. We're, we're good. We're learning from all of this. Um, so if we could talk before we get into the veggies, um, are there any flowering annuals that you should not plant in the same container as a vegetable? Wow, that's a uh, really good question. Um, to my knowledge, no. Um, I wouldn't be surprised to find out that there was, you know, something that, that could pose a danger. Um, but, but really uh, off the top of my head, no, um, as long as you, you know, I'm sure there's plants that, you know, consume more water than another or a plant that would grow bigger or quicker than another. And, you know, you might want to stay away from it for that reason. But, you know, if you're not afraid to pinch, I don't, I don't think there's any reason you couldn't do that. Um, you know, I'm sure there's, there's an instance somewhere along the ways where, uh, that happens, but, um, I don't think that, uh, um, I don't, I don't have a rule that, you know, you don't plant this with that for this reason, because so hopefully that uh, helps. Yeah, it did. And then if you could tell us a little bit about, um, 
growing vegetables, which we're going to get to, but if we could talk a little bit about the containers on a balcony with a lot of sunlight, what is the best kind of container to use for growing vegetables and herbs? So on a balcony, um, yeah, you know, the best. I, I don't, I don't think, uh, I don't think you're ever really going to beat that smart pot, but I don't think there's a, a reason that that you can't do it in in any other sort of container. Um, you know, the the nice thing, um, you know, about the any of the containers is if you you get one that's heavy enough, um, you know, you, you should be set up for for success. The uh, you know the the big thing there, just you know, filling it right and staying on the feeding schedule to. Um, you know, keep yourself going. And I think the, uh, you know, other part of that is just having the, uh, the right amount of sunlight there um, to, to keep you moving. Great. And then this might seem like a silly question and we did find your presentation and we're going to bring that up in just a second. Cool. Um, so if you could, again, this seems silly, but what does perfectly watered soil look like? If you're using a regular pot, not a smart pot, that's going to tell you by shooting water out the sides. All right, so um, we'll, we'll touch on it a little bit um, in 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 the the presentation when we get it back, but we can talk about it at this point because I don't have a great uh, visual aid for it. But uh, one of the things in, in in our continuing education that we were doing last summer was uh, it was it was about shifting the focus of your watering. There we go, um, and and I I struggled uh, to to come up with with the guy and his principles um, because it was a, uh, a paid educational course and, and it disappeared in September. Um, and I, I just couldn't pull any of that, that, that event or that course's information up. Uh, but you know, the, the, the way that the guy was talking to you about um, your, your plants and water was, was he wanted to shift your focus from watering your plants is it, into, you know, working on keeping uh, um, water off of your plants and, and, you know, getting your plants to use the water and then getting the water out of your container as quickly as possible um, while, while keeping your plants in an optimal range. So if you looked at, at the high end of the, the spectrum would be number five, and that would be like super saturated soil. We've all had that, you know, experience where, you know, either we filled a, a container that didn't have a drain and then, you know, eventually that, that soil just got really spongy and they tend to get stinky and, and maybe have some moss or algae growing on the top of them. That's level five, which is a level that you want to stay off of. And then there's there's all the way down to level zero, which is bone dry, and that's also the the other level that you want to stay off of. But the the main concept is that you want to spend your your time and your watering with your plants between level four and, and level one or level two, um, and, and you you want to understand and look at what that that soil becomes as you water. If you really start to pay attention, um, you know, to the soil. As you're you're watering your containers, you should be able to pick that up pretty quickly. Um, and 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 you know you, you can assign your own number or system to it, but the idea is is that you don't want your plants bone dry and stressing for water, and you don't want your plants sopping wet and and drowning in water. But but to to give them just enough water to the point where they're not saturated. And then you don't want to add until you get back down to that that level one, um, you know, where the the plant has has a good amount of water for for itself, but the soil looks like it's it's thirsty, and and really just looking at it that way is is how do you you keep the water off of your plants, um, you know, long term is is a going to be a huge key to your success. If, if you're in the store and, and you look around at, at what we do, we've, we've shifted to almost completely wooden tables with um, larger or, or, or gaps in between the wood. Um, our, our metal tables that are, are solid almost always have holes drilled in them so that water can go, um, excuse me, uh, you know, drain underneath them. And, and not just sit there and allow 
um, you know, disease to fester. And any other thing with standing water is it's a, a breeding ground for insects. Um, you know, if, if your life is in, isn't difficult enough already, you know, just add some mosquitoes to the backyard. That'll make COVID fun. Um, you know, so, you know, really just keeping the water moving is, is pretty key. So um, if there's questions on that, um, you know, we'll be glad to, to try and, and, and identify those, um, you know, stages at the store. It may be a little bit easier to do in person, but just kind of finding uh, pictures that translated well to camera was kind of difficult. Um, uh, so we, we didn't try. So I think that was great explanation. Thank you. Um, I don't know if we should go forward or backward at this point. Do you? Uh, so go ahead because I skipped over this because the raw, the presentation error is on my end. So I certainly take responsibility for that. So let's let's jump ahead and see what uh, what we got here, Paul. It's like uh, choose your own adventure. Now we went ran through this one. <laughs> we talked about uh, thrill, yep. fill, spill, but now we're gonna get to perennial. So uh we should be in pretty good shape now so um i i took out a, a good bit of the annual stuff because we we covered a lot of that last year and and the uh um perennials part of it i, I was going to take out again this year but but it, it hit a few things um i think is as we go further and further into the, the the pandemic there's there's a lot of people that really don't care about you know taking some different risks or adding some uh some flair to their 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 gardening experience i've, I've had uh a few customers let me know that gardening is cheaper than therapy and and if they want to kill a plant or break a pot then then that's what they're going to do um but one thing we've seen a lot of this year is people trying to really um put put perennials into their containers and um you know, either either to keep them in there long term or to uh, you know transfer them into the garden so they they kind of get um, a little more utility out of the the plant throughout the course of the season and and we've certainly done both um, throughout the years but there's no reason you can't um, add perennials to your containers and uh, really enjoy them and then you know, you could either uh, enjoy them for the following year or um, plant them in the garden and, and keep them going. Uh, I know, you know, sometimes in the fall when we do that stuff at the store, we'll just throw up on Facebook that, hey, we're done with these plants, come get them. So, um, you know, if if you maybe you got a friend that, that, that doesn't have as many plants or, you know, life circumstances a little bit different, maybe grow some perennials in your containers this year and then, you know, pass them along, just keep them moving. Um, but we'll, I think that the next slide should show you a little bit of what we're starting to do. And, and it certainly does. Um, so this is my house and it's, it's a pretty continual question we have. Um, if I didn't wait till the last possible minute this week to take this picture, uh, it, it might be a little bit happier, but I was kind of running out of time, but we wanted to show you that the boxwoods that we're starting to use um, and, and we are doing it in, in ceramic pots um, in, in front front of the house. But as, as we get, you know, a little bit further, um, you know, in, into life and, and, and life is changing and we're, we're doing a little bit better, I'm, I'm a little more apt to take take the risk with with a ceramic pot in front of the store or in front of the, uh, the house year round. But um, I, I'm not going to be wasteful just just because maybe, you know, you, you can be, um, you know, we, we threw uh, boxwoods in these pots last fall and, and we're going to use them as a, a three season container. Um, started with uh, um, Christmas, actually. And if you look to the right, you, you can kind of see them. Uh, but but what we did was. We planted the boxwood, um, you know, in a round pot to, to one edge, and, and it allows us to do some different things, or, or maybe have like the, the boxwood in the container along with a uh, like a, a, a different bed that will change out seasonally, um, you know, to keep the containers fresh. And what we did was we put some some actually lit Christmas trees behind them and, and rotated it. So that you know the the trees could stand tall against the pillars in the winter, and the boxwood would would be front and still kind of block some of that tree trunk. And then we 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 went around with just some uh, 
some greens around the edge. Well, you know, as we progress through the winter, we yank the greens out. Um, if you look really close to the left of my stairs, I bet you the pile's still there. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we ripped the greens out. We spun the pots. And, and, and at some point this weekend, the pansies will go in there. And, um, you know, we'll grow them that way till probably late May, mid-June, and, and we'll switch them out. Um, I'm thinking at that point, I'll probably take the boxwood out and put them into the, the garden. Um, one thing I'm trying to do with, with the boxwood this year is we, we put in a, a few uh, boxwood in the backyard and, and the dog has been kind of using one of them for his uh, markings and uh, he jumps over them constantly and has been beating the heck out of them. So, you know, those may slide into the hedge perfectly or we're just going to work them into the landscape and allow, um, you know, allow them to grow naturally and, you know, just be uh, on the lookout for something new and a little bit fresh for the pot, but, you know, certainly not um, looking to, to, to toss those or, or just, you know, use a, a plant that, you know, doesn't continual, continually give to us. So that's, that's kind of one way you can look at it. Um, edible container gardening, certainly at the forefront of what's going on at the store right now. You can see the, uh, the smart pots um, out on the deck. And, and, you know, I think there's a little bit of cool stuff you can see um, in terms of space management. And, and I know we had the, uh, you know, the question earlier um, on, on keeping tomatoes upright in the smart pot. And, and you see, almost looks to me like maybe tomatillos or, or cherry tomatoes at the, in the center of the picture. But the TP trellis is really a, a pretty smart way um, to, to not have a, a large trellis. And, and it's, it's anchored in multiple different pots, which is, is really pretty cool as well, because you're, you know, you're, you're still building a trellis, but at the end of the season, you can pull those out, you can fold them up and they go in the garage. Um, I bet you if you're, you're clever enough, you don't even have to really um, untie those. You just give them a good yank up and, and, and just tuck them away. Uh, nasturtiums up on the rail there. Uh, Rail planting is certainly something that's uh, uh, done done a lot in in my family, and uh, you know we, we're constantly struggling to find different ways for everybody to to set themselves up with a uh, a container that fits on their rail. So I'll apologize up front for that. We we thought we found a good supplier for deck rail planters, and then as soon as we did, they probably went out of business. Um, you know, so. I think I think what lends itself to those struggles is is the part of the the character of the neighborhood that we live in is is everybody has a different rail um you know even just looking at the back porch of of this uh you know it looks like there's two different rail sizes and and that's before you get into you know 1900 uh, wrought iron or you know the the lumber that you're building with today or, or the vinyl railings that you might have you know, so don't give up, but everybody's got a unique rail and, you know, you just got to kind of find a container system that works best for you to, to grow on your, your deck or your railing. Hey, Paul, so we've yep. got uh, two questions. First one, uh, last year, Heather ended up with some tiny green bugs on uh, her basil. Any tips to prevent that from happening? Uh, sounds, sounds like aphids. Um, yeah, aphids are tough. They're, 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 they're generally around. Um, you know, there's a few organic sprays you can use on them. Uh, you can, you can break up your patterns and, and use deterrents when you plant. Um, and, and then really uh, just kind of keeping an eye out for them. I know a lot of people just hose the aphids off their plants and, and keep an eye on them when they're watering. And if, you know, they show up, they, they, uh, um, you know, just hose them off again. I know, I know there's people that, you know, a lot of times at the store, if we end up with an outbreak of aphids, the plants go into garbage um, and, and not even the, uh, um, sometimes if it's bad, it's, it doesn't even end up in the compost pile. It's just garbage, um, you know, just to try and interrupt that cycle and keep those, those pests away. Um, you know, the, the destroying plants part is tough, but if you end up with a bad infestation, um, 
you know, you're going to destroy one plant now, or you want to destroy, you know, 20 plants in, in a month is, is really what you got to look at. And, you know, really the only way that you stop the, the increase is you have to interrupt the breeding cycle, which can be, you know, 24 hours, um, you know, a 24 hour cycle. So, um, you know, bugs in Lakewood are difficult. I, I think it's a, uh, uh, the challenge is made greater by our, our proximity to the lake. Uh, I, I know there's far more spiders here than we ever encountered on the, the east side and, and the bugs seem to just kind of follow that pattern. Um, you know, if anybody's that ever been here for a, a hatch should, should be well aware of that. So, um, got it. Okay. Yeah, if you got another Thank one. We'll you. take it. We can bump if you don't. Let's, we got one more. Uh, let's go to uh, carrots. Uh, we've we've got a couple couple questions here about carrots uh, from Amy. Amy, thanks for resending this. Uh, she said she wants to grow carrots in containers. Would a five gallon bucket work? Should they drill holes in the bottom? And is it a problem if this bucket once held paint or some other type of chemical? All right. So, um, you know, I I know what your bucket held. Um, you know, I know what was in it. And I would, uh, you know, pay attention to, you know, what, what you're trying to put into your body. I also, you know, think that there's, um, you know, reading for each plant that, you know, if you're concerned about that, you should do. Um, you know, I, I, I assume that generally, you know, Northeast Ohio, your, your soil is probably going to have lead in it. Um, it. Most seem to, I, I think it was a, a pretty big part of the paint that we had, um, you know, but if you do the, the, the reading and the research, you, you understand that, you know, really tough to get lead into a tomato. Um, but at the same time, it's not tough to get lead into leafy greens. So, you know, understanding what you're doing and, and what that chemical was and, and what the toxin was, um, you know, that was in it would, would go a long way to, to what you do and what you grow in that container. Um, or you could spend a couple bucks and get a food grade container, um, you know, from uh, Lakewood Hardware. I don't, I don't want to say that, um, you know, I'm an expert on what transfers from one container to another, but, you know, I like common sense approaches and, you know, I'm a big fan of doing research, uh, you know, before I grow stuff that, you know, I'm going to hand to my family. Very good. Thank you. We can proceed if you're ready. That's good. So um, our, our, our raised beds container gardens, um, you know, it's, it's really the same concept. And, and I know we, we deal with, with raised beds a lot. This is, this is my, current, um, my current garden uh, Thursday, I think. The, uh, the stuff's really starting to take off and grow even since then. Um, you know, but if you look at it, we've we've basically taken the same principles of container gardening and and we're working that into our garden. Um, you know, we we did the smart pot beds last year, and and I I, I think we had over 40, 50 bags of soil in there, and and you know at at, at twenty bucks a bag, that soil is pretty valuable. So we we bagged it up, we reused it, we've we've added it to, and, and that's, you know, the, the foundation for our garden. Um, you know, if, if you look, uh, you know, we put in a little stone walkway. I'm, I'm a big fan of making the, the garden experience easier and enjoyable. And, you know, what I found last year is I was not enjoying, um, my garden as the season progressed. I, I had stuff that was, um, you know, growing well and thriving, but, you know, I, I also had a wood chip base and I wanted to go out and water in my bare feet and, you know, the thistles were popping up underneath it and that didn't work and it wasn't fun and it wasn't enjoyable. So, you know, the, the city came through and yanked our, uh, our, a few of our, our sandstone sidewalk blocks and that became the walkway. And, and I found some, uh, Doug fur from, from Cleveland lumber and, you know, that's what we wound up making our, our, our big containers out of. And, uh, 
um, you know, we're using the potting soil. It's going to be phenomenal. If you, you look at the bed on the, the right-hand side, that's, that's garlic. And, and eventually what I think we're going to transition there are, uh, uh, tomatoes around that garlic. And, and that's just going to kind of fill that bed. And, and it's really nothing more than a, a container garden, um, that, that doesn't have a bottom. Um, earlier you can, uh, if you remember, we talked about the, uh, um, the chipmunks moving into the garden. And if, if you look, you can see on the right hand side where the little dip in the soil is, uh, the little buggers hollowed out a pretty, pretty solid area and, and, and moved in there. Um, he's got a pretty extensive network uh, filled out. It, it comes in and out of the, the stones and the gaps. Um, but the, uh, the other part of the, the beauty of the, those stone in there is, um, you know, if you look at like concepts such as a English uh, herb garden, uh, a lot of times they were spoked, a lot of times they include stone or brick paths, is, uh, you know, in the early part of the, the season, the stone and the brick help retain heat, which keeps the soil a little bit warmer, which, you know, so much of what these plants operate off is soil temperature driven, that you can help help keep that a little more consistent and maybe bump it a few degrees in your favor. And, uh, you know, the, the last few degrees when you're starting to get a plant growing are, are pretty important. And that can be, you know, the difference between a real successful harvest and a so-so harvest. So, you know, something to consider, but, um, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the flip side of that is, you know, having that, that raised bed and, you know, a finite source of resource, uh, finite source of food and, and, uh, ingredients is that you're going to have to fertilize more. So we, we put this stuff in probably about three weeks ago. So it's it's about time to, to feed them again. Um, go ahead, somebody got some. Well, oh, before um, we switch to the next photo. So I see we've got lettuce in there. Is that garlic? Mm -hmm. And then uh, is it cabbage or Brussels sprouts? So uh, <laughs> there should be, uh, I didn't do Brussels sprouts. There should be cabbage, broccoli, and um oh goodness cabbage broccoli there's one in there i'm forgetting maybe kohlrabi um uh Great. maybe just simply a different type of cabbage uh my my the the busier and crazier this this whole thing gets is uh um you know, the worst my memory is right now. So like, if you, if you look on the, the center tier, we, we tuck the tags right in there for exactly that reason. Um, sure. you know, what, what is that? Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank God. <laughs> so we're, we're big fans of writing down and you know, that, um, you know, in, in what we're doing in life right now, that the record keeping, I think is, is super valuable. Um, you know, what you planted, when you planted it, what the weather was, um, you know, is, is, is really pretty important. Cause as you, as you bump back, you know, you might plant something this year and, and say that, yeah, I planted it on April 1st. But when you go back and you look at your notes, you see that April 1st was 75 degrees. And when you watered it on the third, it was 75 degrees. And it was the same on the fifth and the eighth, you know, but we never got a, another real bad cold snap after that. And, and you could come out next year and that whole garden could be under snow till May 1st. And you're sitting there going, well, last year I planted my tomatoes in April. And, you know, I, what's different this year? I always plant my tomatoes in April. Well, not if it's six inches of snow. So, you know, sit, sit tight and having those uh, resources available are, are, are super valuable. We're uh, um, starting to get a little bit into ramps and maple syrup and, uh, I was down south yesterday, um, getting some stuff to to start keeping bees, and and the more and more we get into any of that, the, the records are so valuable. It's it's a book, and you know I, I think that, um, you know even if I'd be interested, I, I don't know if I'll leave my records here, if I'll keep them with me, but you know, to, to have that journal of your garden could be, you know, a, a pretty valuable resource to somebody 20, 30, even 50 years down the road to, to see how you were doing it then. And, uh, 
Um, you know, I look back as we, we shift to organics and, you know, that, that kind of skipped a generation and, and we're, we're going back and a lot of, um, you know, research that was done in the 50s and 60s and 70s is super, ap super uh, applicable again because it was done before a lot of synthetic fertilizers and chemicals came out. So, you know, that, that stuff is, is valuable. So keep your notes. Great. Thank you. Hey, Paul, as we go to the next slide, can you just answer briefly, when is it safe to plant? Um, depends what and uh, where you want to plant it. Um, you know, all that stuff we put in the garden, it's, it's had a snow, but I also know that, um, you know, when I'm going to the greenhouses and I'm talking to the guys, you know, who grows what, who grows it and how they grow it, um, you know, the root vegetables, you know, we tucked in as soon as the ground was workable, that the lettuce could be at risk, but the kale in that bed could care less if it snows. Um, the broccoli and cabbage are appropriate to, to have and they'll take a, uh, a, a slight frost. Um, you know, the, there's snapdragons at the corner. Those, those plants took the snow and, and they didn't really mind. Um, you know, you, you kind of want to understand what you're planting. There won't be a pepper, a tomato, a cucumber uh, in my garden till till the last week of um, till the last week of May. It's uh, it's just the way you know you, you got to operate in Northeast Ohio and, and the stuff that's so temperature driven. Um, you know, the warmer the soil, the longer you wait, the the better off you are. Um, it's it's warm outside, but the ground just plays, comes along at a different pace. So, um, you know, we're always glad to kind of help you with that stuff, but generally um, the longer you wait, the better off you're going to be. Understood. Thank you. We're going to continue. There, there's my baby. Um, it, it's, that's our new potting bench. Um, and, and I thought it'd be kind of fun to, to share with you guys because it's something that really, um, made our experiences in the uh, um, in the garden a, a lot more enjoyable uh, and and it made it kind of the absence of that was was tough last year trying to find somewhere a, a nice big workspace at a comfortable working height to plant and uh, you know we're probably gonna do eh, between 20 and 30 pots this year at my house I think and, and having a space to, to work and to store stuff um, was, was, was pretty valuable to us. And, and then the other thing that, that we, we view as, as pretty important is that it, it be versatile. Um, the, uh, the, the beauty of that is, um, you know, you, you can store stuff up on the shelf on top, you can tuck soil under the bottom I think in a perfect world, my, my perfect potting um, bench would have a soil reservoir um, somewhere on the, the main bench where you could just pull it through. But, you know, after, you know, thinking about it a little bit more, we're going to use that as a, uh, as a, a stand, um, you know, to, to stage food, to, um, you know, we used it to, to finish maple syrup on this winter. So I just decided that you know, we can, we can dump the soil or we can pour the soil, um, you know, but, but it's, it's versatile. We'll, we'll hang trowels on there. We'll hang weeding tools, uh, you know, little bags of fertilizer can be, you know, out of the rain. Um, they'll, they'll probably be a Tupperware with, you know, some seed packets and some different things underneath, but, you know, I, I want to be able to, bring a TV out there at some point and watch the Indians next to the fire pit, you know, in the middle of July and, and really, you know, have a good, good evening with our kids. And, and if you, if you consider what you're doing and when you're doing it, I, I think, you know, you, you can really make your experience a lot better and being able to, you know, have versatility out of your, uh, you know, the, the things you use to garden, um, you know, goes a long way. And, and, and the, the other last thing of, of it will be is um, while we don't have water on the garage um, currently, the, the rain barrel should be in um, 
you know, before too long. And, and, you know, that you can see, we saved the soil, um, to the left. That's, that's all my soil. Um, and, and, you know, we, we put paver block down there now that soil's all in the garden and, uh, you know, it'll probably be July 4th now before we get the rain barrel up, but, you know, we'll, we'll work with, uh, you know, Glenn at Lakewood Hardware and we'll put together a kit to, you know, make sure that when we want to water, it's right there. Um, and, and I think I'm going to try to get that barrel off the ground so we can water stuff on the table too. So, um, you know, consider what you're doing and, and try to make your stuff, um, you know, uh, a little bit easier to uh, um, live with. Are, are you guys messing with the, uh, um, the, uh, the tint or the, the lighting on the screen? It was, we have to select it to advance it. So I selected it and, it, and that's all it did. So you're all good. Okay, cool. I think sometimes my computer starts uh, doing that stuff to me when I'm about to run out of battery. I just didn't want to drop off on you. So no, all good. I was um, hoping you didn't see that, but I guess you did. Go ahead, Paul. <laughs> no big deal. <laughs> so, um, you know, and, and, and one thing that, you know, we, we told you we were going to talk to you about is, is using your space uh, effectively. And, you know, that's part of what that potting bench was. And, um, you know, it's part of what I think that, you know, there's, there's businesses around town that do a really nice job of maximizing their space. Um, if you, if you drive around town and, and you, you get around, you, you probably recognize these from Lakewood hardware. Um, but, but, like these containers are so cool for a, a myriad of reasons. Um, one, they're big, they hold soil, they, um, you know, they, they support plants. It, it lessens the, the demands on the watering and, uh, you know, they, they look cool. Um, and, and they're able to be somewhere where you might not be able to have a container traditionally. Um, I know we work with, uh, you know, Lakewood Alive on the, the Blossoms program uh, in Detroit, and we lose, what, probably one a year, Allison, one of those things walks away, those earth boxes? Uh, yeah, usually you know. about that. Or someone just thinks they should take the plants home with them uh, on their way home from the bar, usually. Yeah. So, um, you know, go ahead, have, have five, six beers, try to carry that thing home. I, I, I encourage you to do so. Um, yeah, maybe I don't encourage you to do that, but, uh, you know, that, that's a difficult thing to move. I, I know that when, you know, Glenn wants to, to pick those up, it's with a forklift, um, you know, but in, in plant selection is another big, um, important part of, of having success. And, you know, we, we, we've, we've done pretty good with his containers over the years. And then, you know, we, we switched to, to this combination, maybe, four or five years ago and and boy does it make a difference um you know we use bigger grasses in the middle of those plants to start with we use smaller geraniums and smaller sweet potato vine but you know look at look at the 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 beauty there um and and that's that's right on madison you know continually it get, gets a little bit of shade from the trees um you know, but the, uh, the beauty there is just plants that are set up and, and thrive in Lakewood. Um, that sweet potato vine, the more you pinch it, the more vigorously it grows. Um, the, the geraniums, they're, they're tolerant of the wind. They're tolerant of a, a myriad of, um, you know, weather conditions. And, and it's something we've kind of moved throughout the neighborhood and we've had similar success with it. And, uh, you know, I think that's one thing that, that kind of caught me off guard when I when I moved, um, you know, to, to gardening in Lakewood and, and having a uh, a lot of experiences. There's there's plants that we use to death in Lakewood and we use them, you know, consistently and everywhere because they do well here. Um, we, we sell more Boston ferns in one day uh, in, in this town than I sold in, in 12 years in Cleveland Heights. It's, it's just a, a plant that, you know, on the east, uh, west, it, it does well with the sunlight conditions that most of us have. And it's a plant that can take the driving winds coming off the lake pretty consistently. So, 
you know, understand why you see the same plants consistently throughout town, but, you know, be grateful that we're, we're able to identify and have plants that, that do well because, you know, the climate on the lake sometimes is, is a little bit tricky. We can uh, bump through to, to the next one. Another, um, you know, business that I think just does an absolutely great job of, of using space. Um, you know, Beth down at, at Nature's Oasis really, you know, uh, what, what do we want to call those chairs? 16 inches across, maybe 20, um, you know, but, but she's incorporated plants um, at, at, at three different levels, if, if not plants, um, you know, plants at two levels and, and you know, flowers or, or cut greens at a third. And, and, and it makes a difference to, to the way her store works. And it's, it's a way to look at, um, you know, a, a way to change your environment and really warm it up, um, you know, but she's got the right hanging baskets up against the building. She got the benches and, you know, all of a sudden they're seating for, well, let's call it two, four. You got, you have eight seats. Um, and if you're going to, you know, survive and, and thrive as a business in Lakewood, you know, you, you got to figure out parking, seating and, and, and crowd management because, you know, we don't have a lot of real estate here. So, um, you know, look at, look at what they're doing, see where you can use it and, and, uh, you know, just tell Beth thanks, or, or Glenn, or, you know, um, any of these guys that are doing these programs. So we go to the next one. Sniper, get Ian again. Um, so back to the questions. Here we go. <laughs> I don't know where, where he went, but um, so Okay, well, that answers that question. So yeah. if we could talk a little bit about bringing in together vegetables and flowers. So really what the benefit of that is, and I know we talked about what not to plant. We've already brought up that question. But are there any things that are really are very complimentary? I know we've talked about in the past um, about marigolds and tomatoes, I think, are really great. Basket yeah, buddies. absolutely. Um, you know, marigolds were a very difficult commodity last year, and they're they're difficult because they they do a lot of stuff around the garden. Um, you know, they definitely beautify the garden uh, with their flowers. They uh, also have a scent that a lot of animals find unpleasant, and um, they're also good companion plants for a lot of things. The uh, um, probably the, the biggest part is, is, you know, you get the, any flower, um, that's going to bring bees into the garden is going to be good because the more bees you have in your garden, the more pollination you're going to have. And, you know, if you want to have fruits and vegetables, you got to have the pollination for, for that to take place. So, um, you know, if, if you look, uh, you know, you, you can work any sort of, you know, flower into the garden, um, you know, but if you look at ones that have culinary value, I think that makes it, you know, a, a little bit cooler, um, you know, and just bringing, bringing pollinators in, uh, this, uh, this year, I know, um, you know, uh, I've, I've seen a few articles talking about the, the value of borage in the garden. That's a, a great, um, edible flower, little blue, um, petals with like kind of a black um, center that uh, it, it, it blooms heavily and, and looks great on salads and uh, has a nice little cucumber taste, but it, it, it also really does a nice job of bringing bees into the garden. The uh, one little footnote I'll give anybody who's ever grown forage is it does have a tendency to reseed like crazy, so be prepared for that. Um, you know, but lots of lots of gardens. Uh, lavenders probably you know one of our our biggest you know uh, most popular plants in the garden. Um, you know, it it has the uh, um, the the ability and the smell that that animals don't like, and and you're gonna get the flowers that are gonna bring the pollinators into the garden. So, 
yeah, no, I definitely suggest you, you know, work, work something in there in some way, shape or form to help, you know, get pollinators in. Okay. So we're about to wrap up. Um, what is one tip or maybe two, since you're such a professional, maybe there's not just one that you want to leave people with for getting ready for their growing season? Um, I mean, one, a couple, couple things we like to say pretty frequently is you're not gardening unless you're killing plants. Um, <laughs> and, and that it, it gets easier to, to kill plants as, as you get, um, further and further into it. Um, you know, it, it, if you're not pushing the boundaries or you're not trying anything new and, and you're not having, you know, failures, how do you measure your successes? Um, you know, don't be afraid to, to try something. And, you know, if you push the envelope, then, you know, maybe you come away with something cool, but if you don't, then it's going to be the same thing forever. Um, you know, I, I think in the past two years, I know I killed like 60 fruit trees. We killed 50 boxwood this winter. Um, you know, I, at the, at the start of the pandemic, I lost a, a couple fields of, God, I want to say 600 strawberries. We lost maybe 50 asparagus, you know, like it's not so bad, you know, well, I learned what I needed to do if I wanted to grow strawberries and we're going to attack it differently the next time. You know, and I, I went back out and, you know, out of the hundred asparagus, I found a few spears, um, you know, so we're going to weed around that and see if we can develop our patch that way. Um, you know, don't, don't be afraid to learn. Um, and, 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 you know, the other big thing is, is research. Um, you know, I love learning. Um, most of that's driven by you guys asking questions that, that we're not familiar with and, uh, you know, the more time I can, I can spend outside and, and learn. And, you know, it's, it, it always uncovers something new. Um, and, and that's what I think is so cool about what we do. There's, you know, you, you go down to the reservation today and, and just walk around and learn so much about so many different things. Um, you know, and it's easy because you don't have to pick a plan anymore to learn about it. You can snap a picture and you don't have to develop it. You know, you can bring it right. home and, you know, some people have apps. I, uh, I'm not huge app guy quite yet, but, um, you know, we, we've used it out at the farm where my buddy's like, that's not what you think it is. It's this moron, <laughs> you know, I'm like, all right, fine. Be that way, you know, but you know, it's also how you, you, you learn and you figure it out. Um, you know, uh, three years ago, I'd, I'd never made a drop of maple syrup. Um, you know, that I, I didn't even know what, what ramps were, you know, three years ago. And, and now, you know, it's like, Oh, cool. I know where I can go dig some. <laughs> um, and, you know, you just meet people and, and talk and, you know, we're going to work with Tim from, from Cleveland B and, you know, we're going to throw a couple hives together this year. We're going to try to make honey. I, I don't know, but you know, don't be afraid to fail, screw up. Um, and, and that's how, you know, you can have success, just get better. Okay. So I have one question from Matt left. And then if anyone has any other questions, feel free to send them our way. Um, so Matt is asking about milkweed and if it will do well in containers and if so, will it survive winter in a container? So we've been able to overwinter milkweed. Um, I think ultimately I'd rather, um, you know, get the milkweed in the ground. The, uh, um, it, it's a native, you know, and, and those plants tend to do well, you know, in their, their, their locations where, you know, they, they get that sort of drainage that they're looking for. They've got those, those happy little nooks and crannies that they find and that's where they thrive. Um, you know, if, if you don't have a spot in the ground where you can grow it and you haven't had success and you've tried grow it in a container. Yeah, we, we need you, we need you growing that too. So, um, you know, I, I'd, I'd say you, you can, but you know, I, I would try to keep it in the ground somewhere if, if possible. Okay. And then could you remind us how often we should feed our pots and does it vary between vegetables and flowers? Um, not really. Um, 
feed, feed, feed. Uh, that was, um, I, I should have known we, we, we got a little lost on the PowerPoint earlier, but that was one of the, uh, one of the slides was honestly feed, feed, feed. And the, the happier you can keep those plants, um, you know, the better off they're going to be to you. Um, but, you know, remember that that plant comes from somewhere, all that material and all that matter needs to come out of the soil reservoir that you're growing in. And if you don't um, feed them, you're going to have trouble. So, you know, every three weeks we suggest um, with a plant tone and about every um, six weeks when you're growing stuff that produces a piece of fruit like a tomato or a pepper, um, we, we supplement the three week feeding every six weeks with a bone meal or a calcium supplement. Great. And so, um, Sorry, my computer did almost die there. So I had, to okay. Quick, guys. Oh no, you did. You did great. Um, so, okay. So then you can find bone meal or uh, a fertilizer. You carry them. I know liquid hardware also carries them, uh, organic. So there are some places that you can get those locally. Um, so Paul, I just want to say thank you again. You did an amazing job. I'm sorry for all the technical issues, but it wouldn't be a Lakewood Alive event without us, you know, having to zig and zag. That's what we like to do. Hey, so, uh, I mean, you guys grew out of your bad weather phase, so. Um, <laughs> yeah, we had to move you know, on to something, bad was, technology. Was, I think a five-year stretch where if, if, if I was involved with you guys in anything, it was going to snow or rain really hard. So. Well, it was you and me as a combination. It's when I started at Lakewood Alive is when the weather went bad. So well, a few, few more years, we'll punch through all this stuff and we'll be perfect. Yeah. So really, thank you all. Thanks to the people out there uh, in the interwebs. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Ian. Uh, really, truly, this is a wonderful workshop. We're so thankful for the wonderful community that we have here that comes around and supports us. Um, our next workshop is going to be on uh, Thursday, May 6th, and that is Knowing Your Home Safe at Home. Uh, and it's aimed at aging in place as well as uh, folks who have mobility issues, uh, really designing your home to be a place where you can uh, stay safe. So we're going to talk about mobility challenges and ways to um, remedy those. So make sure to check us out. Uh, and this has been recorded, so it'll be on our website as well as our social media. So you'll be able to watch it again as many times as needed to pick up all of the great information. So thank you all very much, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Take care. Thanks, Allison. Thanks, Ian. See you soon. Come for pansies. <laughs> I'll be there. Okay.